Hello and welcome friends to this lecture on Vinayak Damodar Savarkar and from Savarkar we are going to study his views on Hinduism and Hindutva. Hinduism and Hindutva and his views on Hinduism and critique to Savarkar's views on Hinduism and Hindutva we are going to do in the next lecture. In this lecture we will study basically his personal life, uh, Savarkar as a revolutionary, as a patriot or as a political thinker of um, uh, Hindu nationalism and uh, the different shades and different shifts in his personal intellectual life. This uh, we will do through looking at some of the key ideas or key uh, thinking in his uh, thought, influence on his thought and basically his views on nation, uh, Indian uh, ancient Indian past or Hindu past and also his views on social, uh, social change or social reforms. So, in this lecture we are going to basically discuss his personal political life as well as his in intellectual engagement with some of these themes. Now, uh, before we also need to um, seriously reconsider some of the appropriation, misappropriation and also outright rejection that is being done in contemporary political discourse in India where some takes, some thinker, some idea is either celebrated or completely rejected and there is a kind of rigidity in support and in rejection of some ideas, some thinker, some text. But when Savarkar was writing, so there is a lot of fluidity or flexibilities of uh, dialogue and discussion even when there is a uh, there is a unbreachable differences between two thinkers or two opinions on any issue. So, one of the example that comes to mind is Gandhi or Savarkar or Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose or Savarkar. They had lot of differences and yet they were able to communicate with each other and the possibilities of dialogue was always open. But somehow, that fluidity, that openness to dialogue and discussion even when there is a difference of opinion and unbreachable differences of opinion, that has certainly uh, string in contemporary political dis, uh, discourse uh, and that is not the healthy way and that makes the academic uh, uh, analysis or examination of a thought and ideas even more challenging and uh, certainly uh, complex uh, to, uh, to do. Savarkar remains one of such, uh, such thinker who is celebrated at the same time uh, the opinion about his thought and contribution to his thought remains somewhat divided among the um, uh, follower, among the supporter of Savarkar and also those who critique Savarkar. So, uh, we have to think about Savarkar and his life and his ideas in such, such, uh, such a context where it becomes increasingly impossible to have the dialogue or uh, conversation even with whom uh, we, uh, we differ or there are difference, uh, a difference of uh, opinion. And his uh, ideas were remain inevitable for any political discourse even for those who outrightly reject every ideas and opinion that uh, Savarkar had offered. So, uh, we will look at Savarkar and his thought in, in this context and try to examine uh, academically his ideas on Hinduism and uh, Hindutva and what is the critique to such, such ideas. So, that is something we need to keep in mind when we uh, uh, engage with Savarkar as in his time there is lots of fluidity, lots of openness about uh, engaging or having conversation despite of differences. So, Gandhi went to Savarkar's place to, uh, to maintain uh, the dialogue or the discussion uh, despite of having serious differences with each other's method and opinion on politics and the role of religion in politics. Uh, even um, um, Subhash Chandra Bose went to meet uh, Savarkar and uh, uh, there is very less exploration and writings done on that, but uh, uh, they maintain the uh, relationship or the conversation even with those 
they differ seriously or substantially. So, to think about Vinayak Damodar Savarkar and his ideas in uh, such a context, we see a kind of uh, shift or a kind of evolution of Savarkar as a revolutionary. So, first and foremost, Savarkar was a great revolutionary thinker and he was deeply influenced by the uh, nationalist ideals of Mazini, Garibaldi and many other nationalists. So, in Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, we find him as a revolutionary patriot political activist and uh, one of the most prominent intellectual and the founder of Hindu nationalism in modern India. The tradition of Hindu nationalism in modern Indian political thought began much earlier than Savarkar. So, this ideals of Hindu nationalism which began with uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Aurobindo Ghosh and Lala Lajpat Rai. Vinayak Damodar Savarkar gave it a more virulent or rationalistic foundation and today therefore, Savarkar's name and his political thought and philosophy is almost synonymous with Hindu nationalism or Hindutva and his contribution in the fields of social and religious reforms and struggle for freedom are immense, however, it is less and less a explored and largely ignored by his critique because of his reduction or his uh, um, uh, synonymous with the Hindu, Hindu, uh, Hindutva or hin, Hindu ideas. But Savarkar was equally uh, a revolutionary, a patriot or wanted to uh, reform society and the um, religion as well, especially the evil practices, dogmas and superstitions in, uh, in religion. So, that part of Savarkar in contemporary discourse and debates on, uh, on his ideas and thought is by and large, uh, largely, uh, largely ignored. So, that we have to focus equally when we discuss about his ideas on Hinduism and Hindutva. Now, deeply influenced by utilitarianism, rationalism, positivism and pragmatism. So, Savarkar in his politics and thought was deeply influenced by this rationalistic, utilitarian uh, philosophy or positivism uh, of the uh, contemporary analytical philosophy and also the pragmatism in the politics and he never thought of achieving something which is otherworldly, which is uh, divine. So, he understood the uh, possible pragmatic uh, objectives that a human being or a society can aspire to and therefore, a lot of views on say morality or ethics or whether violence or non-violence should be used as a political tool or not. He had a very pragmatic approach other than Gandhian uh, kind of absolute position on the application of non-violence and such method in politics. So, in Savarkar we find the uh, influence of pragmatism, rationalism and utilitarianism in his philosophy and also political thought. So, Savarkar is also perhaps one of the most celebrated and therefore, equally despised thinkers of modern India. However, it is the power and influence of his thought which makes him and his thought inevitable in any political discourse even in contemporary India. So, his stature or the influence of his thought is perhaps uh, more hegemonic, more dominate, uh, dominating in our contemporary politics than in his time. And uh, his critique is also uh, grown uh, tremendously and yet his supporter or his critique cannot uh, ignore the powerful ideas and in, uh, influence of Savarkar uh, about nation, uh, state, democracy and uh, social and religious uh, uh, relationships, harmony or, uh, um, or reforms. So, uh, Savarkar remains inevitable in the political discourse even in contemporary times even by those who despise Savarkar and that is the power, the influence of his thought and his ideas uh, on Indian politics or imagination of nation. Being situated in the larger framework of Hindu nationalism, Savarkar can be seen in response to two distinct historical trajectories unfolding in colonial India. The first was, he belongs to the radical and revolutionary strands of middle class Indians 
who rose in reaction to the limitation or ineffectiveness of the moderates. So, first stands as it was unfolding during the colonial era was the growing feeling against the effectiveness of moderate leaders of the Congress. So, Savarkar belonged to such group of radicals and revolutionaries who developed a critique of uh, moderates and their method of politics. And second, which was related to the colonial policy of divide and rule. So, as a result of divide and rule policy of the British, they developed an environment of social tensions between different communities in India such as Hindu and Muslims on the one hand, Hindu and depressed classes on the other, Hindus and Sikhs on the another and Hindus and Jains on the other. So, there are growing tension and estrangement among and between different communities in India. Savarkar was responding to such growing um, estrangement or tensions among the communities and trying to consolidate Hindu community for from further fragmentation or as a result of this uh, divide and uh, rule policy of the colonial government. In Savarkar's opinion, it also had a dangerous influence on the body politic of anti-colonial freedom struggle in India and provided the psychological and material background for future communal politics. So, these politics of divide and rule as conceptualized and practiced by the British uh, rule provided the psychological and material background for the emergence of communal politics in India. And Savarkar was um, uh, very um, concerned about the fragmentation of the Hindu communities, not just on religious land, but also on caste land or any uh, or linguistic lines or regional lines, etc. So, Savarkar was trying to consolidate Hindu community and nationalize their history, politics and glorious past in all walks of Indian life. So, he was trying to conceptualize a nation or a Hindu nation in such a way which nationalizes the uh, politics, past and um, uh, glorious history of um, ancient Hindus, uh, Hindu civilization. And he was trying to uh, uh, limit the consequences or the e evil consequences of these divide and rule policies of the British. Now, if you look at the brief history of Savarkar, we find he was born on 28 May 1883 in a Chitpavan Brahman family in Maharashtra and he was born in a period which was characterized by the vigorous critique of economic and political dimension of British Raj. So, there was a kind of growing assertion or realization of the exploitative or extractive nature of British rule. So, Savarkar was uh, uh, developing his critique to uh, British rule on the one hand and consolidating the uh, Hindu uh, community on the other by rewriting their hist history, their past and uh, preventing uh, it from further fragmentation, Savarkar was um, uh, developing those uh, thoughts and ideas in this context when there is a kind of increasing realization and growing critique of the economic and political uh, dimensions of British Raj by one section and also by the revitalization of religious and cultural tradition of native populations. And this theme we have discussed in our previous lectures as well where there is a kind of um, uh, critique which was developing uh, against the British rule at the same time resorting to the cultural or the uh, religious resources of Indian civilization or Indian religious tradition to uh, develop a self, uh, develop a modern Indian self which will give them the confidence to fight against, against the British. So, if you remember in one of our lecture we have discussed Partha Chatterjee's ideas of inner and outer domain. So, the outer domain is the domain of politics and economy where they thought they need to learn from the British and they can master it. In the inner domain that is the domain of religion or a spirituality, they consider themselves superior and nothing to learn with the, uh, uh, learn with the Brit, uh, British. So, um, Savar, uh, Savarkar was uh, developing his political thought or um, articulations 
in a time where there is a growing realization of the uh, economic or political exploitative nature of British rule and the cultural and religious revitalization of Indian so social life. So, many thinkers including Gandhi, Tagore, Vivekananda, Arvindo Ghosh, they were all uh, in a way deeply influenced by the cultural and religious uh, traditions of uh, 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 their communities including Iqbal we have discussed in the previous lecture. So, uh, uh, the influence of political as well as the cultural religious background on his thought needs to be taken seriously when we try to engage with his thought. This impact of the temporal, the period in which Savarkar was developing his thought is very evident from the early stage on his life and he was disturbed by the news of communal rights and developed a deep admiration for the Hindu tradition and past and he was anguished by the brutal repression of the British rule and considered it responsible for suppression and devaluation of the pious Hindu tradition and he took a lifelong woe to fight the British and regarded as a young firebrand revolutionary by the colonial government. So, Savarkar from the early childhood developed a kind of uh, uh, and because of his uh, elder brothers and also younger brothers were also revolutionary active in the politics. So, Savarkar developed a taste for politics from the very uh, beginning. He was deeply disturbed by the growing communal tension and the uh, uh, communal rights uh, disharmony between Hindu and Muslims and thought of uh, conceptualizing Indian nationhood or Indian nation on the basis of Hindu religion and he derived a lot of strength and inspiration from the ancient Hindu glorious past and try to revive, uh, revive it to develop a um, uh, uh, Hindu nation or Hindu Rashtra, uh, Hindu Rashtra in India. At the same time he was also very critical uh, of the brutal repression and suppression of the uh, uh, suppression of the British rule. There are many instances of uh, uh, such um, expression. One was Chablakar Bandhu was hanged by the British uh, because they were involved in the assassination of Rand, the, um, uh, who is sup the colonial administrator who was supposed to look after the victims of the plague instead of that he was uh, celebrating the uh, celebrating and not uh, paying attention to the needs and uh, um, uh, health and other requirements of the uh, victims of the plague. So, uh, this nationalistic patriotic feeling in Savarkar was there from the very, uh, from the very beginning and he developed it uh, further when he went for higher education in England. So, after his primary education he enrolled in this Ferguson college in Pune in 1902 and uh, he was influenced by nationalist leaders who differed from the moderate politics within the Congress and if you remember 1907 there was a divide not just uh, between the moderates and the extremists within the Congress but also the growing uh, disenchantment between Hindu uh, and the Muslims. So, Congress claim uh, itself secular but in opposition to that there is a growing claim by the Muslim League as the representative of the Muslims of India. Similarly, Hindu Mahasabha and many other religious and the sectarian organizations were being formed. So, um, uh, Savarkar enrolled in this Ferguson College in Pune in 1902 and he was influenced by the politics of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipan Chandrapal and Lala Lajpat Rai and there he got engaged in many nationalist and the political activities in the college life. Although the college forbid any kind of political activities or anti-government uh, protest and demonstration, uh, Savarkar continued to organize the youth involved in the protest, organize the demonstration and also um, invited uh, uh, Tilak which greatly infuriated many administrators and as well as the teachers in the, uh, in the college. Uh, he organized their patriotic society called Abhinav Bharat, which he continued to do and organize and reorganize uh, even in, uh, in England. So, this Abhinav Bharat he organized in the college among the friends and through the medium of literary works began to revisit India's glorious past and he was the one who recognized the role of such literature 
in the production of future revolution in India. So, uh, there has to be a cultural resources on the basis of which one can uh, imagine oneself, derive the strength and inspiration to fight the oppression and suppression of the British rule and create a new, uh, new Hindu India or uh, uh, revive the uh, glorious past. And he remained committed to this ideal of producing literature or revolutionary literature and its role in the freedom struggle or in the uh, um, uh, uh, freedom uh, movement. So, this production of literature despite of his political activities has shifted from a revolutionary patriotic to a um, founding uh, father of the imagination of Hindu Rashtra or Hindutva. Uh, till the end of his life, he continued to uh, write um, uh, literatures and through that try to revive and articulate his thoughts on Hinduism and Hindu, uh, Hindutva. So, this he did till the end of his life. He also engaged in the public burning of foreign clothes in 1905, if you remember the partition of Bengal which lead to lot of uh, criticism and protest in different parts of the country. Savarkar organized one such um, uh, protest of burning foreign clothes and he convinced Balgangadhar Tilak to speak on that occasion. And this infuriated the principal of the college and he was expelled from the college because of this uh, political activities. Now, with the help of Balgangadhar Tilak and Syamji Krishna Verma who was trying to provide a scholarship to those Indians committed to the freedom struggle and uh, uh, independent movement. So, with the help of Bal Gangadhar Tilak and Syamji Krishna Verma, Savarkar was given a scholarship, a scholarship to study in Britain with the condition that he will never accept government service in his later life. And he remained a student come revolutionary there and help in the organizing of the political movements and especially the youth revolutionary youth in Britain from 1906 to 1910. During this period, he was associated with Abhinav Bharat Society, which was also known as Young India Society. And he along with his fellow members learned the methods of many revolutionary tools and techniques like bomb making and other kind of revolutionary activities there. He was greatly influenced by Italian revolutionary Mazzini. And he wrote a biographical essay on Mazzini in Marathi and translated several essays from the, from the volume Life and Writings of Joseph Mazzini. He considered reading Mazzini and Italian history very necessary as it can in his opinion serve as a guide to India's struggle for independence. So, he uh, although this is less explored, but he was also uh, intellectually engaged with the revolutionary ideals, uh, revolutionary ideals for political freedom or political um, political indi uh, independence, and himself claimed to be a revolutionary. So, um, and uh, this ideas of revolution and revolutionary is very different for, say, instance, communist revolution or the uh, revolution as uh, conceptualized by Marx. His conception of uh, 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 revolutionary and revolution is very different from uh, such conception or anti-capitalist uh, 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 thinking. And therefore, many uh, scholars refute his contribution in revolutionary thinking. But, uh, but um, uh, Savarkar developed a different, uh, different articulation of revolution and on that basis he was able to write a very successful or uh, influential treatise on the first war of Indi uh, independence about 1857 uh, uh, revolution. And uh, there he was influenced by Mazzini, Garibaldi and many other Italian uh, nationalist uh, leaders and he thought that the Italian history of nationalist movement can help as a guide for India, uh, India in its struggle for freedom against the British. There he also wrote this text called the Indian War of Independence, which is published in 1909. This is the same year when Gandhi published his famous treatise Hindu Swaraj. And it is also interesting to note that Gandhi met Savarkar for the first time in England. And then after a long time, when Savarkar returned from Andaman to Maharashtra, 
uh, Gandhi again uh, developed a conversation and personally visited his home to discuss ab about different methods and tools of, uh, of uh, freedom struggle. So, uh, despite of their serious differences that uh, openness to have a conversation, to um, a dialogue is something that is uh, missing in our contemporary discourse on these thinkers and their ideals, uh, which was uh, there when they were articulating and expressing their differences. Now, in this text on the Indian War of Independence, Savarkar considers the War of Independence synonymously with revolution and he criticized that neglecting the actual long term revolutionary roots of 1857 struggle emphasis in scholarly debates and discussion was given to the short term accidental causes of uh, this revolution. So, the, for the first time he argued on the 1857 rebellion as a first war of independence and this was uh, very influential and immediately banned by the British government. And this text was translated in many uh, Indian languages as well as in European languages like Spanish, German, French. Uh, uh, besides many others and uh, has uh, uh, provided a different perspective to the whole struggle of Indian uh, movement and uh, enable a kind of uh, confidence against, um, uh, against fighting uh, the British uh, through revolutionary method and not as uh, Gandhi and later developed non-violent uh, movement in the form of Satyagraha. Now, Savarkar's life in Britain came to an end when he was arrested in the accusation of being involved in the killing of an official of the India office and taken back to India for trial. So, Savarkar was developing his revolutionary ideals and as well as inspiring and involved in many revolutionary activities also um, um, uh, when he was there in England. Uh, when he was transported to India, he escaped from the strip when it stopped at Marseille by swimming back to the shore of France. He sought asylum in France, but recaptured by the British soldier and France considered this as an act of offence against their sovereignty and registered a case in the International Court of Justice in The Hague. The court gave the judgment in favour of Britain and this created a political turmoil in France. So, one can very easily imagine the stature of uh, Binayak Damodar Savarkar uh, uh, by 1910 or uh, 1900, uh, uh, 1909 and uh, uh, it gave him in his uh, instant access to the uh, not just Indian uh, popular uh, movement and leaders, but also um, in, um, in the world and there was divided opinion on the Savarkar and his method of politics and his involvement in the uh, revolutionary movement and this happens with a number of nationalist movement. So, when they fight against the oppressor, for the oppressor that uh, fighter or revolutionary may be a terrorist, but for the community for whom that person is fighting for him, he may be a revolutionary or uh, a liberator. So, uh, such opinion was. Uh, um, uh, there with the uh, revolutionary or a patriot, uh, patriot uh, Savarkar. Now, in India when he was brought back, he was given the 50 years of imprisonment. This is the double life imprisonment and that is to in a cellular jail of Andaman, infamous cellular jail in Andaman and this jail was known for which is also known as Kalapani. So, this is the severest kind of punishment a revolutionary or a uh, political activist can uh, imagine and he was given 50 years of imprisonment. So, one can very well imagine the revolutionary zeal in Savarkar uh, thought and his political activities and why uh, British consider him as the young firebrand uh, revolutionary and he they wrote confidential note to the um, uh, British official when he went to England for studying uh, law. So, he was sent to cellular jail in Anman and this was known for the cruelest environment and higher rate of suicide because many of them could not withstand the harsh treatment of the uh, jailers and also the um, environment uh, in Andaman. So, they 
a large number of them committed suicide. Now, the, after the harsh treatment and solitary confinements for 10 years, there have been serious attempts for the release of Savarkar. And many nationalist leaders, including Gandhi, were involved in putting efforts for the release of Savarkar. So, despite of their political differences, their differences in terms of method or imagination of modern India, uh, they regarded, they developed a mutual uh, respect for each other's contribution in the freedom struggle in the, uh, in the movement. It is very unlikely to, uh, to happen in the contemporary times where there is a kind of uh, clear cut separation and less and less dialogue and um, uh, conversation and mutual acceptance even when maintaining the uh, differences. So, uh, Gandhi and Savarkar differ from each other seriously, substantially and yet recognize each other's contribution in the, uh, uh, in the freedom struggle. So, for his uh, release, many nationalist leaders were putting efforts including the Gandhi and Savarkar also wrote a mercy petition, twice uh, I believe, mercy petition to the British and this petition was heard and was and he was transferred to the western India in Yarbada and in Ratnagiri jails and uh, there was the condition put on him that he will not involve in any political activities and will not move out of his uh, uh, district without the prior permission of the authorities. So, and finally he was released in 1924 from the jail and till 1937 his movement was restricted and he was barred from taking any part in political activities including the national movement. Now, in this period when he was brought back to India, he wrote a text called Essentials of Hindutva. This becomes the basis of his political thought and later his conceptualization about Hindu Rashtra or Hindutva and how it is different from Hinduism and this we will discuss in the next class. And this text he wrote in the, with the pen name A Maratha to conceal his identity from the constant surveillance of the colonial regime. In this book, he described his philosophy of Hindu nation and how is it different from the religious notion of Hinduism. This we can, will discuss in our next lecture. Savarkar also wrote his biography, which is called Life of Barrister Savarkar. This he wrote in 1926 under the pen name Chitragupta. Now, this text, which basically deals with his uh, revolutionary life and uh, uh, Savarkar as a revolutionary patriot, uh, patriot thinker, this text get immediately banned by the government and it remained so till India attained independence. It primarily focused on his revolutionary career, but the fact that the actual writer was Savarkar himself, so somebody writes his own life and about his own life that is called autobiography, but Savarkar wrote a biography which is a third person writing about someone else that is biography. But Savarkar interestingly wrote his own biography and not the autobiography which later he wrote as a memoir. So, the point however is in this text again Savarkar seriously contemplate about uh, revolutionary and revolution and revolutionary tactics and which uh, method of revolution will be more suitable and appropriate uh, uh, in Indian context. This fact that Savarkar wrote his own biography came to light in 87, much after his death in 1966. Now, after his release from jail, Savarkar joined uh, for a brief moment the Democratic Swaraj party and soon withdrew from it as it, he realized the ineffectiveness or inconsequentiality of the party. And from 1937 to 44, he served as the Consecutively, he served and single-handedly prescribed the political program and policies for the uh, realization of Hindu Rashtra. So, uh, from 1937 to 1944, he served as the president of All India Hindu Mahasabha and using his own revolutionary ideas, he sought to give it a radical turn. So, from then on, uh, Hindu Mahasabha began to play a more active, more dynamic and radical uh, role in Indian politics. Later on, in, after the independence, Savarkar was convicted of assisting in the murder of Mahatma Gandhi or assassination of Mahatma Gandhi in 1948 by Nathuram Godse. He was a Hindu fundamentalist member of right-wing Hindutva groups and, um, uh, and along with him, uh, he was uh, trialed by the government of India. But due to lack of 
evidence he was acquitted by the Supreme Court and from then on he chose a life of relative solitariness, limiting himself to writing and giving occasional public speech. But he continued to write on the glorious Hindu past and envisioned a Hindu nation. And he wrote six glorious epochs of Hindu history just before his death in 1966. So, the religious rhetoric of Savarkar became sharper in his later writings and these have a great influence on politics and programs of various organizations and political parties such as the Rashtriya Sansevak Sangh, Bharatiya Jan Sangh or Bharatiya Janata Party in contemporary politics. They derive a lot of ideas and um, 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 inspiration from the writings of Veer Savarkar or, or Swatantra Veer Savarkar as they call. Now, to look at his ideas and thought, we find in Savarkar a kind of synthesizing of territorial conception of nation on the one hand as defined by uh, Congress and many other nationalists and the religious and cultural notion of nationalism on the other as it was conceptualized by Muslim leagues. Uh, Savarkar tried to combine or synthesize between this territorial conception of nation and the religious and the cultural conception of uh, nation. So, while he believed in the common territory of Hindustan as the fatherland and the holy land which he called Pitrabhumi or Punyabhumi and more on this in the next lecture, he also stated that Hinduism not a single religion but an integration of all religious creeds which includes Buddhism, Jainism therefore, natives to the land of Hindustan which he also called Sindhustan, Sindhu that is the name of the river and on that the name came uh, Hindustan, S is pronounced as H in per, uh, Persian and therefore, uh, those who are living in that land depending upon their different uh, religions and uh, linguistic and other differences, they are all Hindus. So, his definition of Hindu is very different from a religious and uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, narrow uh, fundamentalist conception of Hindu and uh, uh, Hinduism. So, therefore, he included Buddhism, Jainism within the Hindu fold because they consider India both as a Pitrabhumi or Punyabhumi and he uh, declined such a status to some religion because for them the holy land is not in India. So, for um, Savarkar, Hinduism is not a single religion but an integration of all religious creeds native to the land of Hindustan and share the common heritage of Hindu culture and blood. So, there is a kind of racial conception of Hindu and uh, Hindutva also. So, he did not reject but modified the territorial conception of nationhood and stated that although territorial unity matters, it is the elements of religion, culture, race and historical affinity that contribute more in the formation of nation. So, his basic contribution to the literature of Hindu nationalism lies in his idea of Hinduism and Hindutva which we will elaborately discuss in the next uh, lecture and here the discussion will be limited to his conception of history and other significant contribution to social thought. Savarkar was in favor of the ideal of Hindustan for the Hindus. Occupation of this land by the non-Hindu race was considered as an act of aggression. This in his views, the right of the non-Hindus of living in Hindustan depended on their acceptance of Hindu dominance, so Hinduization of national life or polity. This indicates the ideology of cultural chauvinism, yet Savarkar did not totally negate the right of minorities to coexist although made it conditional. So, this we can discuss further in the next uh, uh, lecture, but uh, in his conceptualization of Hindu Rashtra or Hindu nation he did not negate completely the right of minorities. He made it conditional uh, to their acceptance of uh, uh, this land as a uh, Hindu nation. Now, in his conception of modern state and democracy also we find, he wanted all citizens to be treated equally in accordance with their individual merit or worth without any consideration to their cultural and religious differences. So, this is uh, kind of as a, we were discussing about the fluidity of the uh, and uh, circulation of ideas. So, despite of his religious, chauvinism will not be a correct word, but a kind of religious conception of nation or nationhood, his conception of a state is more or less uh, 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 modern and republic. So, uh, and therefore, 
he uh, was against the British rule and wanted uh, uh, the um, authority or the um, power to rule uh, over India in the hands of Indians uh, uh, themselves. So, in his conception of modern state and democracy, he did not want citizens to be treated differently on the basis of their uh, religious or cultural differences, but on the basis of their individual merit and worth. And he also therefore then opposed any kind of preferential treatment given to minorities as it was being advocated by the Congress and the Gandhi. Although he was in favor of subordination of Muslims, Savarkar particularly in the later part of his life did not question the British rule and that is a kind of radical shift in his approach to the politics precisely because of the pragmatic uh, historical circumstances where on the one hand there is a Congress promoting or uh, propagating the secular uh, notion of politics, there is a growing assertion of Muslim separatism by the Muslim leagues, the emergence of depressed classes and increasing fragmentation of um, Hindu community and demands by the Sikh and many other uh, uh, religious uh, communities. Uh, make uh, Savarkar to respond to uh, colonial rule in a much more what he called responsive cooperation and distance himself and his politics from the mass movement and this is something which developed in later parts in Savarkar career. So, from a revolutionary patriot to a Hindu nationalist, Savarkar also developed a pro-British pragmatic approach in the later parts of life and that remains a controversial um, side of Savarkar uh, uh, politics and activities. Now, if you look at his conception of Indian history, Savarkar glorified the great Hindu rulers of the past and his ideal was Shivaji and Rana Pratap and for him Shivaji represented the rule of Swadharma one's own religion and Swaraj governing one's own self. Now, he deeply appreciated Shivaji in his uh, text Hindu Pad, Pad Sahi which he wrote in 1925 for his militarism against the Muslim rule. His interpretation of modern Indian history was quite radical. This is evident from his analysis of 1857 revolt and he criticized the efforts of reducing it to a mere mutiny or a rebellion of ship boys resulting from the immediate cause of greased catries. Savarkar was critical of such uh, uh, reduction in the analysis of the first war of Indi independence. Instead, he stressed on the inherent revolutionary roots which was accumulating over a period of time against the brutal suppressive policies of the British rule. So, instead he stressed on this inherent revolutionary roots of first war of independence and portrayed it as the mass movement and not just a sepoy mutiny as Britishers and many scholars have argued of the liberation against the oppressive rule of the British. It was for him the first war of independence, hence the title of the book. So, he had sincere admiration for the militant methods against the Gandhian non violist method of protest in 1857 revolts, and he thought it best suited in response to the brutal oppressive rule of the British. Now, if you look at his uh, social thought, we find Savarkar, um, uh, as it is argued by Ashok Chausalkar that uh, Savarkar's thought is characterized by three distinct tenets of social change, which was an influence of European tradition on his thought and thinking. First was the survival of the fittest, second the inevitability of violence in society and absence of absolute morality in the human affairs and uh, human politics. For Savarkar, all human society and you find these three tenets in his social political thought throughout in his political programs, political activities, conceptualization of nation and therefore, the uh, uh, pragmatism in Savarkar is one of the uh, characteristic tenets uh, in, uh, in his thought. So, all human society is characterized by struggle in life of individuals. In this only the fittest can survive and others get eliminated. This is the Herbert Spencer kind of idea, the survival of the fittest that is the modern civilization and the root of modern civilization is the competition. Every one compete against everyone and only the fittest will survive. And also Savarkar then considered the violence is inbuilt in nature. It is only in the later development of society the principle of non-violence got intertwined with violence. However, 
absolute non-violence is something he rejected, the Gandhian ideal of non-violence or satyagraha in all circumstances in absolute form is something he completely uh, uh, rejected and he thought it will make the nation uh, and community weak to, uh, to respond to uh, the immediate circumstances, even the invasion or oppression. Uh, he, uh, the method uh, uh, for him, violence or non-violence. So, he do not reject non-violence completely, but to accept it in all the circumstances in the absolute form is something he, uh, he, reject, uh, he rejected and criticized. He believed in the relative morality, that is morality or immorality of an act, political act or policy is judged in accordance with the specificities of the action and objective. So, the means and ends that we have discussed in Gandhian, um, uh, Gandhian model is uh, given different interpretation in Savarkar's uh, thought uh, that is more pragmatic and that, uh, that uh, depends on the objectives one uh, and through one's act one want to achieve in the larger, uh, larger politics of their community. So, this he had a dynamic, a view of dynamic change in society and society is an inevitable to change in accordance with the changes in the time and one can only survive if she or he is able to cope up with the changing nature of society and therefore, he wanted Indian Hindu society to also undergo through this dynamic forces of a change in modern society and polity. And he therefore, argued that Indian society should get rid of the unnecessary and the evil practices of the past and follow the paths of science and reason. It is in this context, he criticized untouchability existing in Hindu society and stressed on the need to give up such evil practices for the sake of its further development. So, Savarkar worked for uh, religious and social reforms uh, as well. He allowed the entry of um, um, uh, untouchables or uh, uh, excluded community and he fight for their, uh, their entry. Even in schools, uh, uh, the children of uh, those uh, so called outcast or untouchable communities, Savarkar wanted them to be integrated within the larger fold of uh, uh, fold of Hindu uh, Hindu society and uh, similarly with the uh, women and also Savarkar wanted to reform Hindu society in line with the modern science and reason and criticize a lot of dogmas and superstitions that accumulated in the long stagnation period of Hindu society and he wanted to reform it, reconstruct it in the line of modern science and reason. Now, in the similar line, he had nurtured a critical perspective of dealing with the ancient religious scriptures and advised following it only if it is able to deal with the changing need of the time. So, he is also not someone uh, blindly following the ancient Indian scriptures. He wanted um, um, such texts to be read, to be engaged with, but it should be followed which enables the individual and community to, uh, uh, to respond to the uh, contemporary needs or the changing needs of the time. So, this is social thought is quite promising and offers critical insights into the functioning and develop, development of Indian society or Hindu society. So, uh, Savarkar basically um, um, uh, had a um, uh, far more visionaries or kind of um, uh, futuristic uh, approach in his thought when he think about reorganization or restructuring of Hindu society and uh, uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu Rashtra and how it can be done or how it should be done. We see many political parties, organizations continue to derive their inspiration and strength from his, uh, from his writings and that makes Savarkar uh, inevitable in any political discourse in, um, in contemporary India. In the next class, we are going to discuss his views on Hinduism and um, Hindutva. The lecture I have given you can look at some of these readings like Savarkar and his times by Dhananjay Kir and also this text which we have done from long time for many thinkers, sources of Indian tradition and also political thought in modern India. And this article you can also read to understand his revolutionary ideals and conceptualization of revolution in 
in Savarkar. So thanks for listening and thanks for your patience. Thank you.